but we can be just like, we can be just as guilty sometimes. We can think, oh yeah, we got the word. We know what the word is. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we can be just as guilty as they were of being hearers and not doers, and which leads to the next question. You know, if we if we read something in the scripture and we think, oh. God, that's what God wants me to do. And, you, and we're convicted by it. Do we make the change? <laughs> Do we do what the Word says when we're convicted by the Word? Or do we say, oh no, that doesn't apply to me. That applies to those other people. They don't apply to me. And again, it, it, rem it reminds me of two different scenarios in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, when Paul preached to that crowd, were they convicted by what Peter said? Absolutely. And what did they do? Men and brethren... What shall we do? Now, you go over a few chapters to when S Stephen is preaching to another crowd of Jews. Were they convicted by what he said? Yes, they were. What did they do? They picked up stones and they killed him. So, you know, which are we? When we're convicted by the word, do we make the change? And the third question, kind of the third application is, when we sin, do we feel godly sorrow that leads us to true change? Or when we sin, do we feel the sorrow of the world that is like, oh, well, you know, I shouldn't have done that. Maybe next time I'll be a little more careful. <laughs> or maybe next time I won't get caught or whatever, okay? Or does, does our sin produce that godly sorrow which leads to repentance, which leads to eternal life? Just some things to think about. Anything you want to add before we move on? So the first parable concerns their rejection of John. The next parable is about their rejection of Jesus. And, so, and that's the parable of the wicked vine dressers. Um, and so let's begin in verse 33, Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, and leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son, saying to them, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize in his inheritance. And they caught him and they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits of the seasons. And Jesus said to them, did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind them to powder. Okay, so do you see the rejection of Jesus in that parable? So we have the, you know, the, the landowner, which is God, obviously. But I want you, this is something that we don't talk about that often. He, he has this vineyard that he leases to these vine dressers. But did you notice what he did before he leased it to them? This is all the preparation God made for Israel to be the nation out of which the Messiah would come. He took all of this preparation 
And then what did the vine dressers do with it? <laughs> They'd squandered it. And they, so who are the servants that the, vi- that the landowner sends to get the vintage? The prophets. And, he, and it talks about him doing it twice because he sent prophets over and over and over to them. And every time they reject it. Okay? Then he says, I'll send my son. And what did they do with the son? They killed the son because they wanted to take what he had given them, what he had provided for them, and use it for their own purposes rather than for the purpose that God intended. As it said, let's, take, let's kill the son and take the inheritance. We'll make it, we'll make it ours. Exactly, exactly. And so at the end of the parable then, what was Jesus' question? What will, what will the, that landowner do with these vine dressers? <laughs> and they answered the question of their own fate. They said, he will kill them miserably. What happened to Jerusalem? <laughs> They died miserably. They died miserably. And so they, they kind of really spoke a prophecy against themselves. But what Jesus does is he says, have you not read? And he reads out of Psalm 118 and verse 22, a prophecy about the cornerstone. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And so he's telling them essentially, what you're doing by rejecting me is fulfilling this prophecy in Psalm 118 of rejecting the chief cornerstone. And so how does that apply to them? I mean, I, really, it, it, Jesus doesn't have to explain this parable. The kingdom of God, verse 43, will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. What does that mean? It, it is, it is going to be that, that the kingdom of God is no longer going to be limited to the Jews, but it's going to be opened up. It's going to be opened up to a nation who bear the fruits. <laughs> going back to what John preached, the, the fruits of repentance and, and the, you know, the fruits of righteousness. And so they, he says, you're going to lose your place. And it's going to be given to another who bears the fruits that God expects out of his kingdom. But also notice, um, well, let me go back to something too. Let me go back to that idea of the preparation that God had made. Part of the application is that all after all that preparation, what did they use their opportunity for? They used it for themselves. They used it selfishly, and they had rejected the prophets and rejected Jesus, so their place as God's chosen people was going going to be taken away. But then we also have to look at verse 44. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind them to to powder. Now, what's the stone? The stone is Jesus. So Jesus says, some people are going to stumble over me. What do you think that means? They're going to re- reject him, but I get the impression that here, here that he's not talking about something permanent. Because, what, again, what happened on the day of Pentecost? There were some Jews there that most likely had stumbled over Jesus before he was crucified, right? But what did they, some of, what did some of them do afterwards? 
when they heard all of the evidence. They repented. Okay? So they stumbled and they were broken a little bit, but not destroyed. But look at the second part of that. But on whomever the stone falls, it will grind them to powder. That's another group of people. And, and to me, I, the, the way I read it, and I, I could certainly be wrong, but the way I read that is that these are the people who always rejected Jesus, who never accepted Jesus as the, as the, the Christ. And what was going to happen to them? He said it would grind them to powder. They just they would be completely destroyed, um, and so it's kind of how I see that. That's kind of the application that I see. Uh, it sure will, yeah. Hell will be permanent, um, and then again, as we talked about, the other application is that what was theirs would be given to another. The kingdom uh, would be opened up, um, but again, I think there's some application for us. Can we suffer the same fate as the Jews <laughs> if, we, if we don't stay true to Jesus and to his word? Um, I think so. Ha has, God done, has God done as much for us as he did for the Jews? Has God done more for us? <laughs> Than he did for the Jews. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the lesson here is we see what they did, that all of God's preparation, all that he did for them, they kind of took it for granted, they squandered it, and they lost it. And what happens when we take the blessings that God has given us and use them for our own selfish purposes? And you can't help but or I couldn't help but think of what Jesus says to the different churches uh, over in Revelation uh, chapters 2 and 3. If you look at, uh, we won't look at all of these, but let's look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, where he's uh, talking to the church at Ephesus. Um, he says, all of these good things, but look at verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. They were doing a lot of good stuff. But Jesus said, you're missing the mark on a few things. And what did he tell them they needed to do? Repent, turn, get yourself, get yourself right. Or... Bad things are going to happen. Remove your lampstand. Go to um, verse 14. This is the uh, church at Pergamos. Again, good things in verses 12 and 13. Good things they were doing. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So again, can we, can we lose our place? Absolutely. Um, you go... Every one of the seven churches that Jesus talks to in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, except one, he says, you're doing these good things, but this is where you need to make some changes or else. So yeah, we can lose our place. Just like the Jews lost their place, we can lose our place if we don't take care of the things that need to be taken care of and appreciate the blessings that we've been given. Okay, I think we're going to make it. So, the last parable then that Jesus teaches is the parable of the marriage feast. But I want you to look with me first at Matthew chapter 21 
at the very end of that chapter because we're going to move into chapter 22 for this parable. But look at uh, verse 45, Matthew 21. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took, they took him for, does that sound familiar? They couldn't, say, they couldn't say that the baptism of John was from men because the people held John to be a prophet. They couldn't lay hold of Jesus because the people held Jesus to be a prophet. Again, what does that tell you about how these religious leaders felt about John and Jesus? They didn't see them for who they were. So, but they drew this conclusion that Jesus was... And that was, they drew the right conclusion for once. That Jesus was talking about them and it made them angry, made them want to kill him. But then he tells this parable. Verse, uh, chapter 22, verse 1. Jesus answered and spoke to them by parables again and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, the fatted cattle are killed, all things are ready, come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and went their own ways, one to his own farm, other to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out to the highways, gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But, um, and we're going to stop right there, because the last part we'll cover during the invitation tonight. I told you I had a plan. Um, so... This first part of the parable, actually, you, you can divide this um, parable up into two parts. First of all, there's the preparation for the wedding feast, which is what we read. And the second part is the wedding feast itself, which we'll talk about in a little while. But the first part, the preparation for the wedding feast is the part of the parable that I've kind of called or I've kind of termed Jew specific. This is specifically aimed at who Jesus was talking to. Because you talk, he talk about, again, you have the, the father um, of the bridegroom his, who's obviously God and he sends his servants to go invite the guests to the wedding. Who are the servants? It's the prophets, okay? And, of course, they're rejected, and some of them are killed. And what do those invited guests do? We don't want anything to do with that. That's stupid. That's, you know, they make light of it. They, 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 they make light of coming to this wedding feast and even go so far as killing some of the servants sent to invite them. So this is the Jews rejecting the prophets, Okay, but again, look at verse 4. He sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, and the fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. This is a preparation that God had made for his people to enjoy the blessings of the bridegroom, of the Christ, but yet they... they rejected him. And so what was God's response? Look at verse 7. When the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. <laughs> that sound like Jerusalem to you? <laughs> so part of the response was judgment. Did the Jews come under judgment for rejecting the Christ? Absolutely they did. They lost, their, they lost their identity 
as a nation and were destroyed because they, so their, their judgment. But I also want to point out that part of the father's response to their rejection was mercy. Look at verse 9. When they rejected, he said in verse 9, go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. Who's that? That's us. <laughs> because it said they went out and they beat the bushes and anybody they could find was allowed to come in to the wedding feast. And so the father showed mercy. The kingdom was open to all. And so here in just a few minutes during the, um, during the invitation, um, I, want us, I, I want us to talk about the, um, sorry, I got behind. I want us to talk about the feast and how kind of how that implies, that, uh, excuse me, that applies to us, okay? Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about that okay. in, in, during the invitation tonight. Okay. I'm going to tell you how I read it. Okay. Um, and I think, actually, I read it about three different ways. But I also, I also don't think that any of those three ways, because they all kind of apply in the same way. It's just three different ways of looking at it. But we're, we're going to talk about that uh, here in just a few minutes. But I'm going to go ahead and... I'm just going to stop right there. I know we've got a minute or two left, but I'm just going to stop right there. Um, and, uh, and we'll pick up here in just a minute during the invitation. We're going to pick up kind of where we left off in our Bible class tonight. Um, in Matthew chapter 22, uh, the very first part of that chapter, uh, I guess probably down through about, uh, well, about down through about, 14, by verse 14, Jesus is telling the parable of the wedding feast. And, and we talked about how he teaches three parables right here in a row. Um, kind of all of them aimed against the Jewish leaders. Talks about their rejection of John uh, as a prophet. We talk about their rejection of Jesus. Uh, and then it talks about, again, um, their, their rejection of Jesus in the first part of this parable of the wedding feast. Um, and so uh, we see there in verse 7 that when, you know, when they refused uh, to, to come to the wedding, the king heard about it. He was furious. He sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And so we see that you know, God was going to bring judgment on them for rejecting Jesus. But then in verse 9, we see also an element of mercy there where it says uh, the, the, the king told uh, the, um, or, yeah, the king told his servants, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So we see then that the kingdom was going to be opened up um, to those who would you know, accept coming into the kingdom. Um, and then I'm going to begin in verse, um, verse 10. It said, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called but few are chosen. And so what we see here, again, understanding that the king in this parable is God, um, the, the first thing that we notice there beginning in verse 10 um, is that uh, God examines those who enter the kingdom. Because it said that the king came in and he looked over the guests. So he was examining him. And that is, you know, God examining those who come into the kingdom. But the interesting thing that we, we see is that as he looked out over the guest, he found a man who was not dressed appropriately, who did not have on the proper wedding garment. Um, 
So we see a man who could have been prepared, but was not. Now, what we have to understand about this, and, and you know, I think uh, Ms. Betty mentioned this, is kind of hard to understand. If you don't understand the customs of Jesus' day, the wedding garment, when one, one was invited to a wedding, was provided by the host. And so this man would have been given the proper garment when he entered into the wedding feast. But as the king looked out over, he saw that this man was not wearing what had been provided. He was not wearing the proper garment. And so what kind of person is this then as we make the application? For those of us who are in the kingdom, how, does this, how can this apply to us when God looks and he, he sees something amiss? Well, it could have been, you know, this could be the type of person who just kind of goes through the motions, but their heart is not really in it. They, they, they serve God, they do the things that God wants done more out of a sense of obligation than out of a sense of either to family or to, to whatever, but their heart is just not in it. So that's... A, that's a possibility here of what kind of person we're talking about. The second kind of person could be those who, you know, entered the kingdom properly. They obeyed the gospel and, and you know, right at first they were, they were just what they needed to be. But then somewhere along the way they laid aside that garment to where they were no longer what God wanted them to be. Or, it could be what we see all too much of in our religious world today is someone who claims to have entered the kingdom, but they entered by some other way. Um, or they, they claim to have entered by some other way, whether it be by you know, the, the, the sinner's prayer or you know, some, some other thing. But as God looks out over them, he doesn't see what he expects. And what I find interesting about this parable is that none of the other guests noticed that this man was not dressed right. And what that tells us is that you can fool the people, but you can't fool God. You know, you can, you can put on a good show, but you can't fool God. So... Are all that claim to be in the kingdom truly citizens? Unfortunately not. And that's what, part of what this parable teaches us. But here's the good news. You know who you can make sure is a true citizen of the kingdom of God? Yourself. <laughs> and so if I'm taking care to make sure I have the proper garment, that I am truly a citizen of the kingdom, serving God the way I should be, then that's a good thing. And that's what we need to be working on. It doesn't mean we, we can't help others be what they need to be. But we need to ensure that at the wedding feast of the king, we are properly clothed. Uh, and so tonight, if you're not a Christian and you're ready to put on that garment, if you're ready to obey the gospel, be baptized for the remission of your sins, we can do that. Or if you're a Christian that's struggling, uh, being properly clothed, so to speak, um, we can help you, we'll, we'll strengthen you, we'll encourage you, we'll pray with you. Whatever the need may be, please let us know how we can help as we sing this invitation song.